today on DIY Wheels, we're gonna make buildings! Yes! So this project begins with me breaking down all the sheet goods into their appropriate sizes. This project requires six sheets of three quarter inch plywood, two sheets of quarter inch hardboard, and two sheets of eighth inch hardboard plus a whole bunch of one by material for the face frames and the door frames. If you want to build this yourself, I have a free set of plans available on my website, diybuilds.ca. There's a link in the description. Now that everything is cut down to the appropriate size, I can bring it over to my pocket hole machine and start batching out the pocket holes before I begin assembly. If you're interested in how I built my homemade pocket hole machine, I have three build videos on my YouTube channel, link in the description. So now I'm going to start assembly on the small cupboard that hangs off the side of the main wardrobe body. I first install a spacer, and then some glue, and then keep everything in place with a clamp while I drive in the pocket screws, as to avoid shifting the material. I then turn it around, and then focus on what will be the bottom of this cupboard, and do the same thing, clamp, glue, and screws. I'm always wiping up the excess glue as I go, as it avoids a lot of sanding and cleanup later. The next thing I do is install some spacers to keep my shelves at the same height on both sides of this cupboard. Again, I mark my line where I need to place glue, put the shelf back up against the spacers, and drive my screws against the spacers, keeping them from shifting as I drive in the screws. With my spacer installed, I can now mark out where all the glue needs to be placed, and then start driving in my screws to complete assembly on the main structure of the small cupboard. I can now flip the cupboard on its front so its back is facing up, apply glue around the perimeter, and slap on the 8th inch hardboard. This is going to be held in place with several half inch crown staples. The next step was to cut some 3 8 inch dowels and fill the pocket holes on the bottom. Once the glue is dry I come back with a flush trim saw, cut them flat, and sand them with some 80 grit sandpaper to make them nice and flush. <laughs> Next I can begin work on installing the face frame for this small cupboard, which is installed with some glue and some inch and a quarter brad nails through the front. The top piece, however, has a few pocket screws, just for a little bit of extra support as it only would have normally that front edge to glue to. And with that, the small cupboard is complete, and all I had to do was the exact same thing one more time, because this entire project is mirrored. Now it's off to the main wardrobe assembly, which is very simple, but it is a little bit big and unruly, so it's a little bit difficult to assemble all this. Using clamps was my friend here, as it kept everything in place while I drove in the pocket screws. With the nature of how I'm assembling all this, it's going to be pretty close to square. However, if it's out of square, which you'll see that it will be slightly, it's not a big deal because when I go to install the back piece, I just make sure to line up everything with that as I know that back piece is totally square.
I can now rip up some 1x4 material into my face frame pieces and I add some glue to the front of the plywood, placing my face frame on top and then just attaching it with a whole whack of one and a quarter inch brad nails. The bottom part of the face frame receives a pocket hole on the top of each side just for a little bit of extra support. Now with the help of my super special helper, I can mark the length and then cut it on the chop saw. Next I'm going to have my helper help me drill some pocket holes into the top, again for some extra support as there's only really that top edge to nail to. And with that high five, the wardrobe is complete, and now on to the drawer assembly. These are held together with six pocket holes in the front and back, and butt jointed and glued in the corners. As you see, I have a piece of squared up MDF attached to my table. This really helped keep everything aligned as I drove in the pocket holes and the brad nails. For the drawer bottoms, I decided to go with quarter inch hardboard, simply glued onto the bottom, and held in place with some crown staples. This is very strong and you don't even notice it now that everything's painted. Next up is the dresser that holds all the drawers. As you can see, the main sides of the dresser, I butt up against a piece of melamine, which I have squared up to the table and attached to the table, as this really helps hold this in place as I drill in the pocket holes from the side. You can see that I'm adding a thickness of cardboard, or actually it's part of a cereal box cardboard underneath, as I know that when I drill these pocket hole screws in, it's gonna move it by about that much towards the table. So that will end up making everything totally flush. When I drilled the pocket holes, I made sure that they were all kind of random. As you can see right here in the middle, if they were in the exact same spot, they would be running into each other in the middle piece. To attach the top, I apply glue to the top of the vertical pieces, and then I butt up the top piece against the side bottom, where I know the exact distances I need to keep everything totally parallel from the bottom to the top. This will ensure smooth operation of the drawers, as the drawers are all exactly the same size. I then use a spacer on the top to keep everything aligned as I shoot in some inch and a quarter brad nails before driving all the pocket hole screws. This makes sure that the pocket hole screws doesn't shift anything as they're driven in. Now that the main structure is complete, I can flip it on its front, apply glue to the back, and start shooting in several crown staples into the 8th inch hardboard that backs it. Adding this increases the rigidity of the dresser immensely. Next I apply the bottom part of the face frame. Now this piece is really wide for two reasons. One, I plan on adding trim around the bottom to all of this, and also it gives me a little void where I can put a power bar and plug in all my electronics underneath. All of the trim is installed in the same way, lots of glue and lots of brad nails. All these brad nails will get filled in after everything is done. Now, installing the center face frame was a little tricky as the vertical piece of plywood had a slight bow in the middle. So as you can see, I kind of used my caliper to shift it around and make sure it was the right spacing on both sides, as this will directly affect the operation of the drawers if it's not totally straight. The center pieces of the face frame don't have anything to nail to, so they both have two pocket holes on each end to keep them in place. The spacers are there to ensure that they are the same spacing on all four drawers. Next I need to install the drawer hardware offsets so that they don't bash into the face frame. This needs to be flush with the face frame, and as you can see on the outside, the piece I had cut was exactly flush, 
but all the other pieces needed running through the thickness planer and custom fit. All these pieces were set up on spacer blocks, had a bunch of glue applied to the back, and held in with about eight brad nails. The same spacers that are used for installing the offset blocks are also used to hold up the drawer slides, which are attached with 3 quarter inch pan head screws. Now that the drawer slides are all attached with four screws in each slide, I can install a spacer block on the bottom, which I screw down temporarily and place on some quarter inch hardboard, as this is what I'm going to use as my spacer for the drawers. I reinstall the drawer slides into the main unit and then slide my drawer in between the rails. I'm then going to pull it out slightly, pulling out the inside drawer pieces and flushing them up from the front before driving in a screw on each side. I can then pull out the drawer slightly further to drive in the next set of screws on each side. This is also done for the third screw. The fourth and furthest back screw is installed by removing the drawer from the slides and done on the ground. With the rails fully secured, I can now remove my spacing hardboard and my spacers which are attached to the back and slide the drawer in. This drawer is going to be necessary to have the spacer offset for the next drawer. As you can see, I reinstall the drawer slides, add a piece along the back to keep it parallel, and my hardboard on top before inserting the drawer. Again, installing the rails on both sides in the exact same manner, one screw at a time. Next at the router table I have a chamfer bit installed and I'm going to be putting a chamfer on both sides of this trim as it will really complete the look and it will also hide the plywood edges. And with this piece of trim installed, that completes the two dressers, two wardrobes, two cupboards, eight drawers, which all now need spackling to fill the nail holes and any cracks between the seams. Next up is giving everything a light sanding with 120 grit, making sure to blow off all the dust before the next step, which is going to be applying a primer to everything, and then finally painting everything with a melamine paint. To apply the paint, I used a foam roller which left a very nice finish, however was extremely tedious and time consuming. So when it came time to spray all the face frames, which you'll see later, I did use a pneumatic sprayer. The next thing I needed to do was get everything out of the room, put the bed up against the wall and move all the old furniture. And as you can see in the corner of my room, I sleep next to my homemade bat with spikes on it, which I call the Persuader. Next step is to remove all the trim around the floor where the new dressers are going to sit and then up top removing all the crown molding around the room. The chisel worked great for starting these and then I could just simply rip everything off. The next step is to measure and mark the locations of where I need to cut the back piece of hardboard to allow the outlet to fit through. I oversize this hole by about half inch on all sides as to make sure there's some wiggle room when I install it. I then move the dresser into place and use it to cut out the carpet as I want the dresser to sit totally flat against the subfloor. Next I can cut up the under pad and remove it then cutting the corners of the tack strip and removing it carefully with a chisel as I'm going to reuse this tack strip on the front and sides to keep the carpet down. The oscillating multi-tool worked great with a scraper attachment for removing all the old glue and foam and all the crap that was left over the years of people putting down carpet. 
Next, I could peel up a bit of the carpet and remove a bit of the under pad to make room for the tack strips. The tack strip I cut to size just by smacking it with a chisel. Because the electrical will come through the top on the opposite side of where the drawers are, I drill a hole in the bottom to allow for a plug to pass through, before installing the dresser permanently in its place. Once fully seated, four 3 inch screws go down directly into the floor joist. So to hang the clothes, I'm going to be using an epoxy coated fence post. I use a Forstner bit to drill a hole partially through on the left side and then all the way through on the right side as the small cupboard will cover up this hole after the post is installed. With some help from a kind stranger I can install the wardrobe and then attach it with several pocket screws from underneath. The fence post comes in 8 foot lengths so I stick my tape measure through the hole into the bottom of the not fully drilled hole and I can measure the length of post I need cutting it to length with an angle grinder in the garage. I now place two spacers to hold the small cupboard in place against the side of the wardrobe. My helper holds pressure against the side and the back wall as I drive several small pocket hole screws into the side, about 10 in total to keep this in place permanently. Next at the miter saw, I can start chopping up the frames for the raised panel doors. There's going to be raised panel doors for two big doors, the two small doors, and the eight drawer fronts. These all receive a dado sized to the quarter inch hardboard as the main panel. In order to create the tenons in the rails, I first at the table saw set a scoring line for the exact length. This is going to reduce blowout which would normally happen on the router table which the router table is then used to clear away the rest of the material. Next I can start applying glue to all the tenons and all of the inside grooves which are going to hold the quarter inch hardboard. This isn't a problem as the quarter inch hardboard does not expand and contract, so all this does is increase strength of the drawer front. With the way these drawer fronts are constructed, there's going to be a void behind where the drawer pulls go through, so I attach a quarter inch piece of hardboard scrap to the middle to make up the difference in space so it doesn't bend the wood as I screw on the drawer pulls. Next is the exact same procedure for the small doors and the large doors. The only difference is I needed to check for square as these pieces are much larger and much more susceptible to racking. As I was checking the large doors for square, I found the best method for getting them back into square was putting them on the ground and pushing on the one corner opposite to make it come back into square. Once the glue had dried and everything was taken out of the clamps, I gave everything a sanding, working my way through the grits up to 220 grit. Then over at the router table, I could put a chamfer on all the outside edges. Because of the sheer size of the large doors, I found it much more manageable to simply take the router table base out and put the chamfer on that way. To apply the paint, I picked up an HVLP electric sprayer. 
Now, I've heard mixed reviews on these things, but as far as I'm concerned, this was a godsend, saved me so much time, and left a great finish on everything. It handled with ease the melamine paint, which is by far the thickest paint that I've ever encountered, and didn't require any sort of thinning. To install the drawer fronts, I used the combination of my adjustable square and a block that I knew was the exact spacing on the back. I then drove four screws in each corner and then flipped it over to drill the holes with a spacer block I had created for drilling the handles out. These handles were pretty cheap and I found if I didn't start them by hand and just went right to the drill, they would cross thread easily and it only takes ruining one set of handles before you start doing things by hand. Using the original spacers I used for installing the drawer slides, I could then reinstall the drawer slides now that everything is painted and in place. Next I can install the rails on the side of the drawers, and I did mark every drawer with a number before painting. So every drawer has an exact place where it needs to go, as the top rails are actually slightly different than the bottom rails. The next step is to reinstall the existing crown molding. However, it's no longer going around the entire room, it's now just going around the new units. This is held in place just with inch and a quarter brad nails, and that's plenty enough strong. And on a side note, if you ever wanted to know how out of square your ceiling is, just install some crown molding. With the crown molding now installed, the floor trim can be installed around the dressers and along the wall with some two inch brad nails. Next to install the hinges on the small drawers, I use one hinge as an offset to keep the spacing consistent and using a self-centering bit, I drill out all the holes and then attach with the screws provided in the hardware kit. Using the same handle drilling jig I used on the drawers, except adding a strip of wood along the back and a marking on the bottom, it'll be perfectly centered for the drawer pulls. To install this door, I simply hold it in place, use a self-centering bit to pre-drill, and drive in the screws to hold it in place. The exact same procedure is done for mounting the hardware on the large armoire doors. However, a center hinge is added for extra strength. The door handle on this is centered, and in my jig I cut a little slot so I could see the marking I made on the front of the door, then drill the two holes and install the handle. I now flip this door over and start scraping off some of the paint, sanding, and blowing off the dust. I then apply a liberal amount of construction adhesive where I know the mirror is going to be placed. This mirror is a custom request for the birthday girl who this entire project was for. While attaching the mirror and pushing down, I realized that it was bowing in the middle as there's a void behind where the panel is, so I threw some quarter inch hardboard behind and pushed down on that instead. Now due to the added weight of this and the unruly size of it, I added a spacer on the bottom and got some extra help to install it. The last thing to do for this project was to install the reading lamps on either side of the bed above the nightstand area. With the back plate installed, I can transfer that dimension down onto the top of the nightstand tabletop. I then mark where I'm going to drill my Forstner bit through, and this is going to hold a wire grommet which is white in color, so it'll kind of hide the fact that there's wires going through the top of the table. 